If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Before life began to wander and roam, before the lands were set into stone, before the rivers of time began to flow, what existed was disorder, it was chaos, until three goddesses descended upon this strange place, the goddess of power, Din, the goddess of wisdom, Nehru, the goddess of courage, Faror. Together, these three goddesses created and tamed this yet unnamed world. Din, with her strong flaming arms, she cultivated the land and created the red earth. Nehru poured her wisdom into the earth and gave the spirit of law to the world. And Faror, with her rich soul, produced all life forms who would uphold the law. In these ancient times, the first race to roam these new lands were the Hylians. Each of the three goddesses gifted this realm a fragment of something greater, omnipotent artifacts, each containing an aspect of their goddess's sovereignty. From Din, the Triforce of Power. From Nehru, the Triforce of Wisdom. And from Faror, the Triforce of Courage. When all three parts were together, this Triforce would reflect the heart and wish of the one who wields it upon the land. Should one whose heart is balanced between aspects of power, wisdom, and courage behold the Triforce, and should their intentions be good, then a paradise would come to the lands. But should someone whose heart was not balanced and whose intentions were impure try to take the Triforce, it would be cast away as its three separate parts and the land would fall into evil. One would remain with the malevolent being that touched the Triforce, whichever aspect they most aligned to, and the other two pieces would go to whoever is most worthy to hold them as dictated by destiny. The complete Triforce was housed within the sacred realm, a holy place connected to this world, and the three goddesses committed the protection of this world and the Triforce to another, the goddess Hylia. The inhabitants of this young world would know and love Hylia. She was a symbol of peace and promise of strength. Eventually, evil did seek out the Triforce, a demon king desired the Triforce for himself, and with his many legions of demons, he brought chaos to the land. The people were taken to the skies and shielded from certain demise by their goddess Hylia. She then chose to cast aside her divinity and place her soul into the body of a mortal, where through rebirth, the powers of the goddess would remain. It was through the wisdom of Hylia's reincarnation and the rise of a courageous hero that would eventually end the powerful demon king. He was cast into a weapon called the Master Sword. It was plunged into stone and safely sealed away within a temple. But so began a cycle of a terrible curse. A great evil was destined to always yearn for the full Triforce to seek it out, to make their wicked wish come true, to reflect their vile heart upon the world. With time, war and conflict did come. Greedy hearts who heard tell of a fabled relic called the Triforce sought it out for their own personal gain. It threw the world into turmoil. Countless lives were uprooted or lost as enemies collided. The world became so volatile that the powerful sage of light named Rauru built a great temple around the resting place of the Master Sword, the Temple of Time. And here, Rauru sealed away the sacred realm, therefore removing the Triforce from reach of any evil beings seeking it out. Three spiritual stones and a melody, the Song of Time, acted as a key to reach the Master Sword. Only the one chosen by destiny to wield the Master Sword could draw it up and open the doors to the Sacred Realm, where the Triforce was now hidden away. Disaster was averted, and a temporary time of uneasy peace came. The sprawling kingdom of Hyrule was established by the Hylians, and no longer bound to the sky or under threat of war, other races began to walk the many corners of this land the water-dwelling Zora, the mountain-roaming Goron, and the forest-walking Deku, and many other races would grace countless tales to come. Tribes of the Hylian took form, creating even greater diversity within the kingdom. The childish Kokiri, the all-female Gerudo, and the secretive Shika, just to name a few. Though relations between states were tense, prosperity came to Hyrule. Cities and villages built and interconnected, Technology and innovation supplied structure and progress. A royal family was established, 
to reside over the kingdom within Hyrule Castle, and those who wished to protect the Triforce from evil forces kept diligent eyes upon the outside world. The Temple of Time was overseen by the royal family, and for generations, matters of the storied Triforce were left to them. It was widely forgotten by most in the outside world, passed into stories of times long gone. But the curse of the Demon King was not without fangs. Destiny would call to those worthy of answering. Our tale takes us first to the desert of the Gerudo Valley during a time when civil war reigned over Hyrule. For countless years, the fighting between the inhabitants of Hyrule had been vicious and cruel. Though the Gerudo were a tribe of all women, every 100 years a male is born who is deigned to be their king. This male Gerudo is named Ganondorf, and this child is different. Touched by destiny, an evil resides within. He would grow to become the king of the Gerudo, yes, but he would go on to do so much more. The power of the Triforce would call to this one. The Hyrulean Civil War destroyed so much, it killed so many. As the fires of war raged on, a lone Hylian woman fled into the forbidden forests of the Kokiri, a childlike race that called it their home. She was not long for the world, but held in her arms her baby, a boy. She had to see him delivered to safety somehow. The injured woman carried the baby boy deep into the forest and was found by the Kokiri. They brought her to their guardian spirit, the great Deku Tree. Sensing that the baby boy was a child of destiny, the great Deku Tree ordered the child be taken in and raised as a Kokiri. The mother of the boy died shortly after, having succeeded in saving her boy's life. The Hylian child was called Link, and he was accepted amongst the Kokiri, thinking himself to actually be one. But the boy was different, born with Hylian blood, not Kokiri. When they were old enough, a fairy would come to the childlike Kokiri, live beside them as a lifelong companion. But no fairy ever came to the boy. Yes, something was indeed quite different about this one. While Link grew in the relative safety of the Kokiri Forest, the civil war was finally ended when the King of Hyrule brought other warring nations to heal under one united banner. Amidst the Hylian people, it was rare to see beings that weren't Hylian. Contact between races and places became limited. Cultures were less vibrant. Resources were a bit more meager. Life became simplified compared to what it had been before the height of the Civil War. But recovery was on the way. The world was mending, albeit slowly. The King of the Gerudos saw in this peaceful instability an opportunity. He knew well of the Triforce. He knew of where the doorway to the Sacred Realm was hidden away, locked within the Temple of Time. The Sage Raru sealed away the Master Sword and the Sacred Realm behind three keys, three spiritual stones and the Song of Time. Even if he could find those three keys, there was still the matter of the Master Sword. He could not hold the Blade of Evil's Bane, but one step at a time, of course. Destiny has a way of working things out, doesn't it? The King of the Gerudos feigned allegiance to the King of Hyrule once the Civil War ended. Ganondorf sought to become closer to the Temple of Time, closer to the seat of power within Hyrule. He journeyed to the lands where the three sacred stones were believed to be, to seek them out for himself. The great Deku tree within the Kokiri forest refused him, so he cursed the guardian spirit to a slow death. The Gorons of Death Mountain refused him, so he cut off their food supplies so that they might all starve. The Zora of their namesake's domain refused him, so their deity Jabu Jabu was made ill and enraged. Though the King of Hyrule accepted Ganondorf's fealty, the Princess of Hyrule was not so keen to trust the Gerudo. The very young Princess Zelda beheld a prophetic dream that gave her a true fear of Ganondorf. Within the dream, a man from the desert came forth and shrouded the kingdom in darkness, but out of it emerged a boy and a fairy who were the light of salvation. The young princess believed Ganondorf to be that man from the desert, and her attendant Impa, a Sheikah woman, promised to aid her in undoing whatever Ganondorf's plan might be. For the time being, they would wait and watch. Across the kingdom, deep within the Kokiri Forest, the boy, he sleeps, 
caught deep within nightmare. He sees a girl his age being whisked away from a city, a look of terror upon her face, and a man clad in black with a vicious grin in pursuit. In the morning, the ailing great Deku tree calls upon a being of the forest, a fairy named Navi, and instructs her to go to this boy without a fairy who is slumbering the day away. He tells her that he is a child of destiny and that he must begin his journey to bring truth and justice to an imperiled Hyrule, and she must be his guide. The Kokiri go about their days as though nothing were amiss, not knowing that their guardian spirit was close to death, and the world outside was dangerously close to boiling over into their home. Navi finds and takes her place beside the boy named Link, and urges him to the Great Deku Tree. There is not a moment to spare. Most of the children of the forest are happy for their friend to finally have a fairy all his own. They cheer him on and give him pointers on how best to work with his new companion, all save the temperamental bully named Mido, who seems to have a lifelong habit of mocking Link for not having a fairy, and that he's been summoned before the great Deku tree spurs on clear jealousy. Mido even goes so far as to try blocking Link's path to the guardian spirit, but eventually must concede the path to him, He's sure to dig a heel into Link before he goes, telling him that he'll never accept him. He's not one of them. He doesn't belong. But Mido is just a bully, right? He couldn't possibly be right. That would be far too cruel. Little fanfare is given to Link upon arrival. The guardian spirit withholds the awful truth of his imminent death and instead asks him to test his courage, to break the curse within the tree. It is far too late for that, but this hero in the making does not need to know that his first foray into danger is for a lost cause. He must begin his journey with purpose and hope in his heart. Together, the boy and the fairy find their way through the decaying Great Deku Tree, finding him to be inhabited by monsters and a beast called Goma. The parasitic armored arachnid has been feeding off the tree and is the finale of Link's first venture into danger. Killing the massive spider thing is the key to stopping the creatures destroying the inside of the Great Deku Tree, and he is successful in his first trial of courage. But it will not stop the curse of death which Ganondorf placed upon the spirit. Saving him was folly from the start. But keeping the spiritual stone of the forest, the Kokori's emerald, away from Ganondorf made it a worthy sacrifice. He warns the boy that the evil man from the desert must never be allowed to have that stone. Before death claims him, the great Deku Tree tells Link the tale of creation, of the three goddesses and their powers, of the creation of this world, and of the Triforce itself and the sacred realm. Though it may not all quite make sense yet, the spiritual stone of the Kokori and the story of creation are as much as the tree can gift to Link before. The end comes. The guardian of the forest fades from this world, and the boy who once had no fairy is tasked with leaving the only home that he has ever known, tasked with saving the world. The Kokori must now contend with this world without their guardian or knowledge of what is beyond their borders. But Link cannot stay to help them in this task. He makes for the forest exit where his dear friend Saria waits. She knows he's different, and that he doesn't belong, and that he has to go. But she does not send him away with a soured heart. Instead, she bids him farewell as a friend, and gives him something that she treasures, her ocarina, so that when he plays it, he'll think of her and remember to come back to the forest to visit. And with this matter concluded... It's time for the young hero to leave this place that was once home, but is no more. The Sage of Light Raru is aware that a great evil has stirred in the land, and that the Princess of Hyrule is beginning to awaken to her own destiny, and that Link has a key role to play in the events to come. Taking the form of an owl, the Sage of Light will track Link's progress and provide insights to help him along the way in this foreign land. The first order of business is to find a particular princess within a particular castle to the north, from forest to sprawling field, and then a crowded and bustling city. These are sights and sounds that the young hero has never been exposed to. Street vendors and shops, back alleyways, adult Hylians and other children, 
just people going about their daily lives whilst he attempts to navigate this strange city. A girl named Malin makes his acquaintance on the street. She's the daughter of a farmer named Talon who owns Lawn Lawn Ranch out in the countryside. Talon went to the castle to deliver an order of milk and left her unsupervised in the city square. Link tracks her dad down at the castle and gets him back on track. It would seem that the rather lazy man isn't the most dependable and his daughter is left to pick up the slack whilst he dawdles about. But Malin is the first friend that Link makes outside of the forest, his first human connection with the outside world. The princess that the Sage of Light directed him to find is within the courtyards just beyond the castle walls, spying on something taking place within. This weird garbed boy, this armed weird garbed boy, is a complete surprise to the girl. Just how did he manage to get past the castle guards? But, well, he has a fairy with him. She'd had a prophetic dream of a figure and a fairy emerging from the forest who defied a dark cloud that covered Hyrule and the boy before her possessed the spiritual stone of the forest. Surely he was the figure within her dream. She introduces herself as Zelda and tells Link of the Temple of Time, where the sacred realm is locked away and the Triforce is kept safe. Three spiritual stones and the Ocarina of Time will unlock the way to the Master Sword, which holds safely closed the pathway to the sacred realm. Safeguards to ensure that evil cannot reach the Triforce. The wise princess beckons the courageous young hero to behold the powerful man of the desert, holding an audience with the king of Hyrule. She fears that this man is the darkness from her dreams that covered all of the kingdom. Though he's swearing allegiance to the king of Hyrule, she doubts his sincerity. Zelda told her father of her dream, but he doubted his daughter. He didn't believe that she was dreaming a prophecy. She fretted the end goals of the man Ganondorf, he was surely in Hyrule to find the Triforce. He was certainly there to conquer the Sacred Realm. He assuredly intended to rule the world. They had to stop him at any cost. Zelda will watch the Gerudo King within the castle. It's up to Link to venture out and locate the other two spiritual stones. They will beat him to the Sacred Realm, take control of the Triforce themselves, and then they will defeat Ganondorf and save Hyrule. They know all the risks, right? Everyone contending with Ganondorf, they know what they're going against, right? How could destiny not be on their side? Oh, I wonder if those words will ring true in the end. During the Hyrule Civil War, many of the roads to neighboring lands were sealed off. No one through. Things were widely the same. Transit into areas beyond immediate Hyrule would require a special pass. Thankfully, the princess can provide just that giving Link access to roads that would have otherwise been closed to him had he not come to see Zelda right away. Zelda's attendant Impa of the Sheikah will aid Link as Zelda sees fit, even smuggling him out of the city. Though Link is a child, she will treat him with respect and honor the role he is to play. She teaches the boy a lullaby that she has played for Zelda ever since she was a baby, a song passed down by the royal family. Zelda's lullaby has an authority and power that Link may need to call upon in his journey, as not all will recognize him as a blossoming hero. The Sheikah woman smuggles Link out back into the fields of Hyrule and directs him towards the village that she grew up in at the foot of Death Mountain called Kakariko. The mountain will be his next objective. The Goron that live up there have a spiritual stone, and it is up to Link to find it and claim it. Kakariko has been doing just fine since the end of the Civil War. The inhabitants live in relative peace, there's a building project underway, and while homes are modestly furnished, it seems a comfortable place to live. Here we meet a few odd characters, like the boss of the carpenters, who stands about yelling at his supposed lazy workers. Then there's Anju, the young woman who tends to her chickens even though she herself is quite allergic to them or Dampe, the gravekeeper, who walks the graveyard at night, and while he might look frightening, he insists he's not such a bad guy and runs a grave-digging tour. Guarding the gate to Death Mountain is a run-of-the-mill Hyrule soldier quite amused at the little hero with a letter from the princess, probably a silly game between the two, but a command is a command. He gives Link access to Death Mountain with a bit of advice on proper equipment needed for the mountain, and a request, actually. He asks Link if he should find himself back in the city, if he'd stop 
by a particular happy mask shop and find a mask his boy would like. The salesman would surely love to make Link's acquaintance. There is business to be done. Understandings to be reached. <clears throat> the mountain itself is a bit wild, but mostly just quiet. It's the home of the Gorons, but there aren't many around, it would seem. The first sign of trouble for the boy is that of a lone Goron sitting beside a sealed-off cavern. The Goron tells Link that this place is of importance to his people, but monsters began to appear within. And then a Gerudo in black armor sealed off the cavern entirely, but he can find out more just up the mountain in their city. It's not a long walk. Just be careful of other Goron rolling along the path. It becomes more apparent how poorly the Goron are doing once in their city. Some even blurt out to this stranger that they're starving, there's no food, they might die, and they're frightened. Their leader, a large Goron named Darunia, has taken the spiritual stone of fire and locked himself away in his quarters, refusing any one entrance unless they represent the royal family. The lullaby that Impa taught Link is proof enough of his mission, but Darunia is rather taken aback at the boy standing before him. He was expecting something different and doesn't believe Link to be the true messenger of the royal family, let alone someone who could possibly assist in the crisis taking place there. It's a stone wall. Darunia cannot be reasoned with and is just more enraged with Link there. Roaming the halls of the city, a pathway back to the Kokori forest is found blocked off by boulders. Making his way through leads Link back to his old home, a maze of pathways with a melody serving as the guide through. A number of characters call this place home. Of note is a skull kid, standing atop a stump playing an instrument all on his own. But theirs is a story for another day. Saria is in the forest, also playing music. She's beneath a broken pathway, happily minding her own business. But her old friend visiting is so welcome and wonderful. To mark the occasion, Saria teaches Link her own song. Saria's song will allow the two to speak over great distances whenever he wants to hear a bit of home. She just knows that this place that they're at right now, it will be important to them one day. She's just not sure how, but she can feel it to be true. Unfortunately, Link cannot remain here for long. There's a struggling people in the mountains that need him, and he has to try and reason with Darunia to give him that spiritual stone. But even upon returning from the forest to the Goron city, Darunia still cannot be talked into listening. He's so angry, so enraged at the situation and the king's refusal to send him aid. The king was a brother to him. Why is he ignoring the Gorons in their most desperate hour? To calm the leader, Link plays for him the song of his friend, Surya's song. He'd mentioned craving something green and natural, and this melody is just what he needed. He dances like a fool for a few moments, just letting go of all of his anger and sadness and anxiety. It brings him down enough that he's able to have a conversation with Link, and a rational one at that. Darunia tells Link that if he really wants the Goron's ruby, then he'll have to be the hero that he would expect him to be. He'll give him the equipment that's required to gain access to the cavern, a bracelet that will allow him to use bombs to blow out the boulder blocking the entrance. And then Link needs to handle the dangers inside. Make it safe for the Gorons to walk once again, lest they starve to death. The Dodongo Cavern is indeed infested with beasts and dangers. The food source the Gorons so severely rely upon is now a death trap. Link does indeed succeed in clearing most of the cavern, but at the end is the King Dodongo, a massive version of the creatures that plague this place. Leaving it alive is not an option, it's far too dangerous to anything that may enter the cavern. With the death of King Dodongo, Link has accomplished what was asked of him by the leader of the Gorons. They may enter the cavern once again, they're no longer at risk of starvation, the continuation of them secured at least for now. And Darunia is true to his word. He gives to Link the second of the three spiritual stones and a promise of brotherhood. In fact, all of the Gorons would embrace Link as family if he would just let them. There are other heroic deeds that must be seen to, though, namely obtaining the final of the three spiritual stones. With no clear idea on where to go next, 
The boy wanders the fields of the kingdom for some time and chances over a ranch at the heart of it. Lawn Lawn Ranch, it reads. There are chickens, cows, and horses running about the estate, and Link finds the girl that he met at Hyrule Castle, Malin. Seems she and her father made it back home in one piece. The girl spends her days working, tending to the horses, and singing her mother's melody under the bright blue sky. It's rather nice to see the green-clothed fairy boy again. Malin teaches him her melody, which she calls Epona's song. It has a calming effect on animals, in particular a wild horse that carries the name of the song, Epona. While at first leery of Link, the horse approaches him once she hears him play that melody. Epona is quite untrusting of people, with Malin being the only exception. But now, Epona will know Link as a friend that she can approach. Following the flow of the river back to the fields of Hyrule leads the young hero to an unwelcoming road and to another encounter with the Sage of Light. It seems that Link's journey must now take him to the Zora's domain, where he will find the final spiritual stone. The Zora serve the royal family, acting as guardians over the greatest water source in the kingdom. Zelda's lullaby will grant him passage into their halls. While things seem to be going well here, there is in fact something very, very wrong. The princess is missing, a girl named Ruto, and her father is a mess over her vanishing, unable to even acknowledge Link's presence. There's no sign of the princess here, and there certainly weren't any Zora girls on the path into the domain, so where could she possibly be? The Zora domain is directly connected to Lake Hylia, the largest body of water within Hyrule. It's a long shot, but maybe the princess is at the lake. There, Link doesn't find Ruto herself, but he does find a bottle containing a letter from her. It reads, Help me. I'm waiting for you inside Lord Jabu Jabu's belly. Still, it's certainly not the strangest communication Link's received thus far. And at least her father will finally know where his daughter disappeared to. Lucky for him, a blossoming hero is here. He bids Link to go to their patron deity, Lord Jabu Jabu, and find his missing daughter. Ganondorf cursed the Zora deity into illness and aggression. When Link offers it food, a fish, Lord Jabu Jabu opens his mouth and pulls Link into its maw as well. Within are beasts and monsters, electrified obstacles, sealed pathways, and of course, the Zora princess. And she is difficult. Rudo is being rather bullheaded and demanding, insisting that she would never ask anyone for help, that she doesn't need help, but since Link is here, he can have the honor of carrying her around like the princess that she is. Should Link leave her behind or drop her someplace far off, she will openly chastise him for doing so. Seems he's rather stuck with her for the time being, adding another layer of difficulty and frustration to an already dangerous situation. It would be easier if she wasn't there, if she returned home. But the girl refuses to leave unless they find the spiritual stone of the Zora. She dropped it while feeding Lord Jabu Jabu. It's somewhere within his belly. While it's not terribly long that the young hero has to carry the damsel, it rather feels like a minor eternity. She's obviously accustomed to being catered to and spoiled. They find the Zora Sapphire deep within the deity's gut and Rudo's disposition rather shifts in seeing the gem. It was her mother's, she reveals, and dropping it into Jabu Jabu was an accident. But now that she has it back, Link is welcome to carry her out of this death trap. Except, the princess and the sapphire are ferried away by something that is not the hero of this tale. Something like an octopus. And when the platform descends, once again, Rudo is not there. Even when Link dispatches the oversized feigned, the Zora girl is nowhere to be found. He cannot leave without her and cannot leave without the stone, so his mission is far from concluded. What lies in the depths of Jabu Jabu is a massive electrified anemone called Baronade, something that is most certainly causing the Zora's deity a tremendous amount of pain. While the King Dodongo stormed about his arena in haphazard lines, the Baronade swings its appendages about in a manner that's difficult to dodge, making the entire room unsafe at any given moment depending on its movements. But the hero does prevail against all odds. He's defeated three great threats to three wildly different lands. Awaiting him in safety is Princess Rudo. She was terrified on her own, but with the Baronade defeated and the Sapphire in her possession, the girl calms down. Outside Lord Jabu Jabu, 
Ruto gives to Link the third spiritual stone, slipping in the slight caveat that it was meant for the man who would be her husband. I hope that doesn't make for any awkwardness later. With his mission finally complete, Link's only remaining task is to return to Zelda in Hyrule. Together, they will throw open the door of time to the Master Sword and use the power of the Triforce in the Sacred Realm to stop Ganondorf. All has gone according to plan. Standing before the gates of the city, a dark cloud descends upon the land. Though this time, it is not a dream that held captive the frightened heart of the boy. This was real. It was happening. The gates descended, and a rider wildly fleeing emerged. It was actually happening. The woman Impa and the girl Zelda in her arms, escaping into the fields of the kingdom. The girl sees Link, though, and in a last-ditch attempt to steer the hero's path, throws something to him inside the moat. And then they're gone. So quickly it happened. But something else happened in that dream, right? Wasn't there more? It's him. The man from the desert clad in black, king of the Gerudo Ganondorf. What has he done? What took place while the hero was on his journey? Ganondorf loudly acknowledges his intent to capture the riders of that horse. They escaped his grasp. He also brazenly commands of Link to tell him where they went. And in response, Link draws his sword. And do you really blame the Gerudo King for laughing? The kid has spirit. There's something special about him. And he's protecting the riders of that horse. Most interesting, no. Perhaps he's worth watching. But it wouldn't do for Ganondorf to just follow Link about, would it? He rides off into the fields into the direction Impa may have carried the princess away, leaving Link to ponder over what just happened. His dream. It happened, so what does that mean now? In the moat of the castle, Link finds the item that Zelda threw to him, a mystical treasure of the royal family, the Ocarina of Time. A message was left with the instrument, a telepathic memory from Zelda, Directions on how to throw open the door within the Temple of Time. The melody called the Song of Time played on this ocarina, along with the three spiritual stones will open the path to him. There's no time to waste. It's up to him to stop Ganondorf now. The young hero decides to cast all other matters aside, to rush to the Temple of Time, and to do what he must to stop the evil king. All else can wait. Link enters the empty temple, and as he was instructed to do, plays the song of time before the altar at the door. He holds all things needed to proceed. With the three spiritual stones upon the altar, the doors open to him. The old tales were true. Within the temple it lies, the blade of evil's bane, the master sword, that so long ago locked away a demon king and holds fast the seal to the sacred realm. Only the one deemed worthy by destiny may draw it and gain access to that place and the Triforce within. And placing his hands upon the fabled sword, Link truly is the hero chosen by destiny to save this realm from evil. Or rather, he will be. Ganondorf sniffed out this plot. When he laid eyes on Link, he knew that this kid held the keys to the Sacred Realm. Link did his work for him. And now the Sacred Realm was open to the evil king, who was far more powerful than the young hero. Link could never stand a chance against Ganondorf, not as he is now. He's too young to truly rise as the hero of time, too young to wield the Master Sword, too young to be the aspect of courage. Now is not the time. Link is sealed away within the Sacred Realm. Within the Temple of Light, a stronghold against evil forces that Ganondorf could never hope to infiltrate. There's no other way. Hyrule will have to wait for Link to come of age. In the meantime, Ganondorf will rise to dominate. He enters the Sacred Realm and tries to take the entirety of the Triforce for himself, 
but he did not prove himself worthy of wielding it. Claiming the whole of the Triforce for oneself requires a balance of power, wisdom, and courage, which Ganondorf does not possess. In response to this violation of the Sacred Realm, the Triforce splits into its three parts, with power going to Ganondorf, wisdom to Zelda, and courage to Link. It is not the complete sovereignty he'd wish to possess, but with Ganondorf now in control of the Triforce of Power, Link locked away into a long slumber, and the still young Princess Zelda hidden away, the Gerudo King may now bring evil and chaos to the lands of Hyrule uncontested. The plot of Zelda and Link has failed. The people of Hyrule will suffer as the madness of Ganondorf brings ruin to everything it touches. Survivors of the initial monstrous invasion flee to the corners of the land and to Kakariko village. Impa hides Zelda away, dresses her as a Sheikah boy, and gives her the new name of Sheik. Impa will train Sheik in combat and stealth, give them the tools and skills they need to survive in this new, terrifying world. This is the new way of things. This is how it will carry on for seven long years.